Amazing grace. I'm a boy. All right, well, we're glad you're here with us this morning. Uh, we're taking a, a little mini break of our series going through the book of James. Today, we're going to uh, look at a chapter in Luke that I believe has some insights for us, has some encouraging words for us from God this morning. And we went through the encounter retreat. We were just searching through the Word, just receiving a whole bunch of things from, from what He wants to say to us. And uh, as I was looking again at this story, I said, this is a story we've got we've to know, we've got to get down inside of us, because it contains some truth that in the hard times it encourages us, in the good times it encourages us, it, it's a great uh, story, a parable of Jesus. So let's uh, turn in our Bibles, if you have them this morning, whether it be electronically or in paper version, we're going to look at Luke chapter 15. As we're going through the encounter retreat, one thing that we repeated over and over again is that there is no sin so great that it cannot be forgiven. Amen. And this morning as we start off again, we uh, I want to encourage us to meditate on that, that there's no sin too great that God cannot forgive. That's right. Right? There's no wound that's too deep that God can't heal. There's nothing in our lives oh, yeah. that God can't take care of. There's nothing in our lives that He can't restore. Sometimes I uh, look at, survey my life, or survey those around me, and I think exactly. sometimes there's, there's destruction around me, there's, there's devastation, there's things that, that look miserable or, or out of place, but then I always can look back to Jesus and know that in Him there's always hope, there's always something encouraging that I can speak, um, there's always somebody that I can point to. So we're in Luke chapter 15, and I love this whole chapter, because it's Jesus, uh, so it start, opens up in Luke chapter 15 with Jesus hanging out with people that religious people thought he shouldn't be hanging out with. So he was sitting, sitting around with tax collectors and he was sitting around with, with sinners and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they had a problem with it. They said, what, what are you doing hanging out with these individuals? And it, it was uh, fun to, to examine this because sometimes I find... I've found different parts of my life that I thought the same thing. I would think about people and what they're doing or where they're hanging out, and I said, ah, that, that, you sure you should do that, or you can't do that, or you know, I had all these, these rules that I had made up in my mind. But Jesus goes on from here, and he notices, notices the religious leaders of the Pharisees, you know, having, having this issue with them hanging out with these people that aren't like them, that aren't believers, that aren't followers of Jesus, or, or followers of the law like they were. And he tells them three parables. <coughs> and then the, each one of them has to do with something that was lost. The first, the first one that Jesus opens up with in verse number three is that Jesus talks about being a shepherd. <coughs> and when when you are a shepherd and, and your livelihood depends on a flock, you you know that you're going to take care of these flock. And he tells this picture of, of a shepherd that had a hundred sheep, and of that hundred sheep, ninety nine of them were safe. They were good, they were, in the, they were in the pen. But he said one had wandered off. And I don't know, sometimes when I, uh, there's a certain value system I play some things, right? And uh, every once in a while I have changed my pocket. I don't know if you guys have this. And, and you drop a penny, right? And, and, and like the penny, I'm like, okay, it's not, I don't really have to go search underneath the counter to, to go and find this penny. It kind of doesn't have a lot of a value to me or, in the system. But, but he said this shepherd, that he had value on this one sheep that had gone away. And he said that the shepherd would go and he would search and search and search until he found that one sheep. And then he goes on and continues with this. He talks about the parable of the lost coin. And, so, and this, this coin was, was valuable because the woman had 10 silver coins and she lost one of these silver coins. Now I can say, I mean, market value today, $25. I mean, this is, a, this is a significant coin for her to lose. And, and so what does she do at this moment? She searches through the whole house and she can't wait to find this one coin. She tears everything apart. And then after that one coin is found, she rejoices and she celebrates and actually gets all of her neighbors in. And they have a party because they found the value of this one coin. And then he continues the story, and he talks about, uh, and, he, and he continues in this storytelling, and he begins the story of the parable son, the, the, 
the prodigal son. So let's read together here this story, Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. This is what this, Jesus tells the story. He says this, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Give me a share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had. He set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out as a citizen of that country, who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am serving to death, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like the one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead, is now alive. He was lost and he's now found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to his house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked, What is going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and, and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friend. But when a son of, you, but when a son of yours who squandered your property with prostitutes comes home and you kill the fattened calf for him, my son, the father, said, You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But when he had to celebrate and be glad because of his brothers of yours is dead and now alive, he was lost and now he's found. Let's pray this morning over the word. Father, we thank you this morning that we have gathered together as family, that we come before you and can celebrate all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Your word is truth, and God, it speaks to us, it encourages us, it challenges us, and it convicts us. Father, we pray today that your Holy Spirit would be at work, speaking truth to our hearts, and Father, allowing us to look more and more like you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I love this, uh, this story again of the son coming before the father. He, he's desiring some more of his estate. He's desiring his estate. He's desiring his inheritance now. And this story that goes unfold, I can see it out play, play out in my life and in those who are around me. So let's examine this. Let's find some truth in it and let it encourage us this morning. The first thing we, we find here is this, this son, right in verse 12, he demands from the father his estate. Father, give me my share of my inheritance. Uh, I don't know about you, sometimes I get in that same kind of mood. I want, I want what God has promised me now, or I want these good things now. I want these pleasures immediately. I, I desire them. The prodigal son begins with this demanding of his father's rightful inheritance. Instead of waiting, instead of waiting for the process that, that God had planned out, the, the way that he had desired for him, the father had desired for him, no, he, he wants to usurp his authority. He wants to take control of his own inheritance, of his own destiny, of his own desires in his heart. He was no longer content with knowledge that someday he would inherit these great things from his father. He wanted it now. He made the decision to leave the love and security of his father's house and venture out into the world. He was in a, a, a perfect place, a place without need. It, being in a, a, an estate like he, like it's described here, he had everything he ever wanted and ever could want. 
He had all of his provision uh, was provided for him, clothing, he had a, a home, a roof, uh, he had the servants that were serving him on a regular basis, he had all that, all that he could ever desire was already there for him. But he wasn't satisfied with that anymore. He wasn't satisfied with that security, that direction that he had for his life. And oftentimes we find that we do the exact same thing. We consciously choose our own path in life independent of the Father's will for us. When we do so, we separate ourselves from the perfect plan that God wants to implement in our lives. This is almost a warning, the encouragement, the, the starting off that, that Jesus was telling these, uh, these Pharisees, that hey, sometimes you guys choose your own ways, your own will, your own direction, apart from the perfect plan, the perfect security that we have in Christ. Let's look at, we continue through this, we'll see a few more things. The second thing we find in Luke chapter 15, verse, verse 14, a little bit further down, that after he had spent everything, he began to be in need. That's an interesting pattern that we see in Scripture. We saw this also in you know, my favorite book and chapter, Romans chapter 1. The same idea is found there. That God actually gives us over to what we desire because he knows that as he gives us over to that, then we'll find in what we are going after, it is empty. And then we'll turn back to him, back to his perfect uh, security that we find in him. So after a while, um, the prodigal son had been enjoying himself, right? We read that he, he enjoyed the pleasures of all of the desires. He went and spent his money. He, he was with... Uh, he said here prostitutes and, and different aspects of life that, that were unlike those things that he found in his father's house. He was going after the things that he thought that he desired, that thought would fulfill him more than the security of being in his father's house. Whatever he wanted was at his disposal, but he found that he had soon wasted his entire life, his entire inheritance on these wild livings. I don't know about you, that feeling that comes upon me when I go after the, the things that are contrary to God's word, and immediately it may bring some satisfaction, some joy, maybe some peace, maybe some comfort, maybe uh, some satisfaction inside of me, but I soon find that it's wasted away. Things became so bad for him that he even dreamed of eating the, the food that he was feeding to the pigs. I can't even imagine being in that position, but there was, there was such uh, angst in him, such, such desire in him. He had wasted everything that now he finds himself desiring that same thing the, the pigs would have. He had left home a rich, cocky young man, but now he reduced himself to a starving, pen, a penniless beggar <coughs> feeding pigs. The pleasures of sin may last for a season, but if we continue in sin, Ultimately, it'll catch up with us. But the pattern we see over and over again. Ultimately, as we continue in this, we will find that it separates us further and further from the blessings of God that we so celebrate and that we so enjoy and we so talk about and, and how Alan prayed over us that we would receive all that the Holy Spirit is and all that the Holy Spirit has for us that we would receive it. There's a blessing in this. That's what these blessings that we're, we're talking about. He has separated ourselves. Sin will separate ourselves so far from the blessing of God, but then we, then we are stuck and we are left with the mess that we have gone after. Like the prodigal son, we will find ourselves in dire need. So what do we find in the situations? And David describes this also, the same kind of desire. He, he said that he could remember the days of old, the days when we used to have parades and we used to have celebrations of all that God was doing. And he could remember those moments when the presence of God was so real to him and the prayers that he was praying, he would answer immediately. And there's, there's, the house of God was filled with people and celebration and dancing. He could look back on those days. Yeah, I remember those days. I, I desire those days. And the same thing happened to the son here. In Luke chapter 15, verse 18, it described the son said, I, I will set out and go back to my father. Amen. There's, there's something that it says that, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, it talks about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. That, that it's like honey on my lips, right? There's a sweetness of it. And, and the son, he, he goes in the same thing. All of these things that he set out after he, they found that they, they don't satisfy, they, they lead to destruction. And now he remembers, it says, I've got to go back to what it was like. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've got to return to that. Just as the prodigal, uh, 
in verse 15 says, yeah, 18, he'll set out and go back to the father. Just as the prodigal son had made the decision to leave his father, house, now he had to purpose in his heart to return, to get back to. Revelation has talked about getting back to your first love, those moments when you desired, when the, the desire in your heart was fresh for the things of God, and what in, in prayer and in his word. It was a conscious choice to leave, now it had to be a conscious choice to return. See, what's true about the Word of God and that we can see over and over again is that we always have a choice to return to our Father. It's never too late. On this side of heaven, uh, on this side of, of death, on this side of uh, Christ's return, it's never too late to say, I'm going back. I'm getting back to what the, the, it was like in the beginning. I'm going back to where the joys was of being in His presence and being in His house. It is a decision we made to leave. That is a decision we make to go back. And God was always there to bring us back and to open our arm, it opened His arms to us. But we must be, must be determined to return back, to take these steps back towards restoration. We we'll see here again in, in verse 18 that not only was the son determined, hey, I, I made the decision to leave, now I must make a decision to come back. He made the decision and took responsibility for his actions that caused the separation, the distance between himself and his father. So this is an important step. He says, he says I, I will return to my father and I'll tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. The prodigal son, see, he accepted total responsibility for the distance between himself and the father. Sometimes in my pride, I have a hard time with this step. Right? Oh, it was just time. It was just business. It's just uh, these things that have led me astray. And, and I, I have a hard time saying, no, I have said, I am the one that has made this distance. I'm the one that has that have missed time with you. I'm the one that has gone my own way. I'm the, I, my decisions have led me astray. Prodigal son here, he didn't blame others for his problems. He didn't sugarcoat the situation. His choice of words was, I have said. And maybe you today, you're, you're wondering, man, I, there, I'm missing something in the presence of God. I'm missing something in the joy of gathering together with the body. I'm missing something when it comes to reading His Word. I, I'm missing something. There's, there's something out of place in my life. The first step in this is saying, hey, I, I, have, I must have done something. Holy Spirit revealed to me, what have I done? Where have I gone astray that I've separated myself from the very presence of God in my life? He fully admitted where he had failed and knew that he was not even worthy to call himself a son anymore. Think about that step that he takes. He said, I, I'll go back and if I could just be a servant in this house, that would be better. David even talks about that when they talk about longing to go back to the presence. He's like, it would be, it'd be better to be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to be anywhere else. If I could just be, just, if I could just be close to him, it, it would be better than where I'm at today. In our hearts, we must decide that factor. We must have that decision-making point where we say, you know what, it's, it's better to just be, it's just better to be just to be close to him. The true repentance, we talk about this all the time, is that the change of mind, it's a change of mindset to say, I, I, what I have done on my own is not what God desires of me. What I've done on my own only led me to myself, but it's a change of mind to say, I'm going back to Christ. I'm going back to His way. I'm going back to His path. I'm going back underneath the umbrella of the Father. And when we make the decision, when we have that change of mind, then our actions change. Then no longer being with Him is a drudgery. No longer being with Him causes pain in our heart. Uh, it becomes a joy. It becomes an excitement that I can go and I can meet with the Father. I can go and I can be in the security of a, of a family. I can go and I can be underneath His presence. I can go and I can experience all that the Holy Spirit has for me. Our actions change. So then I, as we continue in this story, as Jesus uh, is telling it to these Pharisees, what it's like what it's like to be lost. See, these Pharisees thought that they had everything in order, everything right. They thought they knew everything. They thought they had this 
closeness with the Father. And he's describing this to them that, hey, the people that I'm hanging out with, the people that I, I'm around, they're like this lost son. They, they have a home, they have a place of security in, in me, but they don't know. They, they found their own way, and I'm here, I'm representing what the Father looks like to go after these ones that are lost. In verse 20, it says this, that his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. Amen. Yeah. See, again, we've been going through James and we've been kind of re, um, uh, talking about undoing the beliefs that we have about who God is and, and his character. Many times I think, uh, I've said this before, but I repeat it again today, that sometimes we think that God is, 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 is backing away from us. He's sitting in complete position of judgment at this time, but we forget to, to know that, that God is also a God of grace and of mercy. And I still kind of try to wrestle with understanding that completely, that God who is holy and just and, and, and does not accept sin in His presence, but also is one that merciful and great and full of grace and desires us to come to Him. So we have both of these realities in our mind, and sometimes the enemy would love us to think only about His judgment, yes. only to think about how unworthy we are. But the other side of it is that, he, that because of our unworthiness, he, took, he takes step towards us, and He wants to meet us there. The father saw him and was filled with compassion. When the prodigal son began his journey home, his father rushed out to meet him. He was overcome with joy that the son who had been lost is now going to be restored. The past was forgotten. It was forgiven in the tender, loving embrace of the father. He runs out to the son, puts his arms around him, kisses him on the cheek, welcomes him back. And I can only imagine the thoughts in his mind, because I have them too, right? Those unworthy thoughts of, oh God, I, you can't accept me again. Like, I can't approach me again. God, you really love me. And the Father says, yes, holy, I love you. I'm for you. Yes. I want you. Not only did the Father totally forgive his son, but he completely restored him to his former status of family. So it wasn't just a moment of, okay, all your past, all the things, you, okay, I'm just, I'm just wiping those away. So, no, now God also, as a process of restoration, brings us into full circle, back to the place that we have with Him. He put the robe on Him. He put the garments on Him. Remember, He was just earlier begging for food that the pigs would eat. He was lacking the, the, physical, uh, the physical needs of His life. So he gets a new garment wrapped around him, getting rid of the stench of old things in his life. He gave him a ring, signifying a covenant existing between them. When we are reconciled with God, we recover our authority that we have with him. So God has given us authority to, to do his will, to do his works, to do his good, pleasing things on this earth. And now we have that authority restored back to us. When we make a step towards him, he says, it's no longer, you're not just a second, right? You're not just a servant in my house. No, you have my full authority. You can speak for me. You can do things for me. Man, I place upon you the ability to make disciples. It's all there. It's all been made complete. He puts shoes back on his feet. This not only representing the Word of God that, that washes us and cleanses us, but again represents, as we study out the, the times and, and the significance of having feet, it, oftentimes the servants in the house wouldn't wear shoes, but those who were family had sh permission to wear shoes in the house. And so this, again, representing it was a full restoration back to his position in the family. He, not only, he doesn't just stop there. Then he gets the fatted calf and demonstrates great joy and delight in the son returning. He gives it, hey, it's time to party. And, and, and he parties big. He gets all of the servants and he calls them all to the house. He gets the fattened calf. He, he kills that. And they all have a party. They all eat. They all rejoice. And they all are merry because the son has returned. And it says here in the previous story about the coin that when the coin is found, when the sun is found, that all of heaven rejoices. There's a party rejoicing in our decisions to return underneath the protection of the Father. Amen. 
And everybody gets excited. It's, it's an exciting time. That's why this morning maybe it seemed like, hey, everybody got a little bit of extra words, a little bit of excitement. That is because they were rejoicing that things have been made right. Yeah. Things are all cleaned up. And things, things are getting better. Yeah. And, and that's exciting news. Yes. They're all partying. Yeah. Sure. There's a great celebration to, com to commemorate the return of the wayward son. Likewise, the angels are rejoicing. The party of the Father gave on behalf of the Son symbolizes the joy and the peace that we have in our hearts when we are made right with God. Everything the Father did for His Son, God does and sincerely does towards us. He moves <laughs> towards us when we make the decision to move back towards Him. I don't know where, where we are in, in our hearts uh, in what kind of place we are that maybe we find ourselves, hey, I'm more separated from the Father's presence than I want to be. Maybe I've made some decision that, that leads me that way. Maybe life has gotten messy that, that leads me away from His presence. But He said, hey, if you only return, if you make that decision, if you choose in your heart to go away or to, to make distance, then you can choose to come toward Me. And He's saying this, I love this, He tells these stories, He's telling it to these Pharisees. So we'll go back to 15, verse 1. The now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. What I love about this whole passage is that it just shows God's immense heart towards us. His heart is full of love, it's full of mercy, and it desires to be connected with us. Yes. That's the truth of God's character that I would want us to receive in our hearts this morning. God desires to be close to us. He desires for us to experience His presence. He desires for us to experience His Holy Spirit. He wants it. The question that burns inside of us is, are we going to overcome the internal conversations in our heads to say that we're not worthy enough to go after Him, to go back to Him? That we are going to prioritize our time to, to be with Him, to be underneath Him. <laughs> This morning I have a, a video with Richard, if you could help play that this morning. And it's a, a drama to this, to this passage of the parable, the parable of this lost son. And I want us, as we're watching, to picture ourselves making this decision to return back to the Father. You may say, oh, everything's good in my life. You know, there's still things in my life that I need to go and, and return to the Father. I go through this weekend, this weekend again, and I'm reminded of... You ever get tired of your boring day to... It's good. <laughs> uh, I, and I, I was reminded again of areas in my life, character in my life, and say, like, wow, there's still areas where I can go and I can be like Jesus. You ever get tired of your boring day-to-day -day life? <laughs> I'm tired of my day-to-day -day life. <laughs> it's not boring. <laughs> not boring. So as we, as we listen and, and watch this, I'm scared, I want to return up afterwards. But, but ask yourself, ask the Holy, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would speak to us and, and show us where are areas in, in my heart Maybe, maybe immediately as I begin to read the story of the prophet Sunday, you're like, yeah, I know, things are messed up and I need to make a decision to go back and be with God. But and others maybe are saying, hey, I, I don't know, and maybe, maybe there's some areas where I have gone off on my own and rejected the presence of God, and it's specifically that remembrance that the prodigal son had. He remembered what it was like to be with his father. And maybe as you're thinking, this, the Holy Spirit speaking to you, and you're thinking about this story this morning, you're remembering times with the Lord when things were good. Like, you can, you can look back at that, oh, I remember whenever I worshipped, man, I could feel the presence of God with me. I, I remember those times when I couldn't get enough of His Word, and I was staying up late or waking up early just so I could get it. I was like, on my phone, the, the most open app was, was a Bible app, because if I just had a few minutes to read something, I was excited to read, I was excited to get, man, I, I remember those moments when it was exciting to come and be with family, the family of God. I, I remember those moments. Like David said, he remembered those moments and he, he thought, if I could just be a Dorothy, or if I could just get close to his presence again. And maybe you're, that, you're in that boat this morning. 
And say, maybe there isn't some great sin, there isn't some great rejection in my life that has led me to go be eating, uh, desiring to eat with the pigs. But somewhere in my heart, I remember what it was like and what I'm experiencing now with God is not like that. This morning, God wants to welcome you in His arms. And so this morning, let's listen to this and let's examine ourselves and say, maybe there's something in my life that is keeping me from experiencing the Father's security like I once had it. This morning, let's listen. Experience the embrace of the Father again. To return back and to feel His presence come close to us again. To feel that hope, that peace, that love, that security that we have when we know that we're right with Him. So this morning I want to invite you to come. We don't often do that, come down to the altar, but we, I think it's a signifying of us returning, of us taking steps towards the Father this morning. And He wants to meet us this morning. He wants to embrace us. He wants to remind us of what it's like to be surrounded by His presence, to be engulfed in His arms again. And so this morning, whether it be you're saying, hey, I, I have sin in my life and I know I need to make the decision this morning to run back towards God, I want to encourage you to do that. Or you say, I'm like David and I can remember the time when it was full of his presence, when I was full of his love, when I was full of this presence of God in my life and I, I did, couldn't do anything else but desire more of him. If either of, you, if either of those are you this morning, I want to invite you now, come forward and we're going to pray that the presence of God returns into your life, whether it be because of sin, of neglect, or out of just the ways of life that has led you away from the presence of God. This morning, we're going to experience the embrace of God. So why don't you come forward and say, I need to make myself right. I need to experience again the embrace of the Father's presence. I want to invite you now, come and let's pray.